my name is uh, Dr. Kieran O'Carroll. To give you a little bit of background of my experience and where I'm coming from, um, I did a PhD in uh, chemistry at NUI Maynooth, where I studied, researched ways of reducing greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture. And it was while doing that, I realized just how absolutely screwed we were. And this was about 10 or, or 12 years ago. And I have to say, I, I, I got really depressed. I, I really struggled with it. And I got involved with environmentalist movements um, and with with that activism we continuously lost we we got our asses handed to us i still have some nightmares about uh, dutch riot policemen uh, from an experience of the copenhagen um, they really came down as extremely hard and it just felt like loss after loss and it's very depressing and it's very hard to kind of get yourself out of that hole uh, with climate uh, activism. I joined, uh, started working for uh, an NGO called ActionAid, some of you might be familiar with, and while working there, we just saw again and again incredible um, disasters happening because of extreme weather events, particularly in Africa, East Asia, and South America. The amount of emergencies that we were having to declare was just coming off the scale for the organization in a way that we couldn't possibly deal with while um, the rich north continued on in its everyday existence. So it's really searching, as many people were, I think, for a new type of activism, an activism that was really going to make the difference, at the same time seeing the dire warnings from scientists just get worse and worse until the IPCC, the United Nations top climate scientists, declared last November that we had only 12 years to avert climate catastrophe and that 12 years means we need to start now. We need globally to be reducing our greenhouse gas emissions by 18% every year, absolutely transformative change, and continue to just not see anything happen. And then, and then, something, and then something happened. Some activists um, blockaded the five bridges of London, peaceful civil disobedience, and, and blockaded these bridges until they were arrested. And, and this, this was like a lightning bolt. This was like, finally, People are coming together and doing something. And then, of course, we had the international rebellion taking place across 43 countries uh, across, across April, um, the most prominent of which uh, was in London. Over a 1,000 arrests. We held five sites for five days in the capital city. Um, absolutely incredible scene as the police didn't know what to do with us. Um, I had a bit of the surreal experience, uh, next slide, sorry, of being arrested on RT News. Um, I was actually still in my cell when this went out. So the first my mom heard about it was actually uh, watching the news. And when she called me, of course, I couldn't pick up the phone. Um, so that was definitely a new experience. Uh, I'm you know, not someone who breaks the law. I've never broken the law before, but yet here I am finding myself uh, doing this and spending time in, in police cells. Um, along with so many other inspirational uh, people who also were completely law-abiding citizens, from young students to, to grandmothers. I was on Waterloo Bridge on the Monday night at, at, at 3 a.m. when the police were trying to retake the bridge from us. And the person on my left was a grandmother who was 78 years old. And I, you know, I asked her, you know, you, you confident about this? You good? You know, because she probably wasn't showing herself, but I was. Um, and she just took out two pictures of her grandchildren. She didn't say anything. She just showed me them. I was like, yeah, you're you're good. And on my right hand side was a student from King's University who uh, was was there because she was studying climate change, and she just felt she had to be a part of it. So completely across generations, and just and people from multiple communities coming together for for action. And next slide, please. So Extinction Rebellion uses peaceful civil disobedience as a strategy, as a tactic. And it's not just the International Rebellion or the London Rebellion. We've been using it for some time now with bridge blockades, road blockings, council protests, symbolic protests, lock-ons. This is our strategy, uh, and this is uh, our tactic. Uh, next slide, please. But, but why does Extinction Rebellion use peaceful civil disobedience as our, as our primary tactic? And I, I think it's worth considering that for the people in Extinction Rebellion, we've kind of gone through the looking glass. We've been through the long, dark night. And all of us realize that we've looked at the science and gone, we really have one shot at this. 
We have one shot at turning the ship around, at major uh, system change to put us back on course. There isn't going to be another opportunity to reverse the trends that we're seeing. We are it. And so what we need to do is get our strategy and our tactics right. We need to give ourselves the absolute best chance of success. And it may be a slim chance of success, but we still need to use the best ta tactics and methods we've got and give it the best possible glorious try we can. Uh, next slide, please. So peaceful civil disobedience, people think of people like Gandhi and Martin Luther King. And those are people that our tactics emulate, absolutely. But the reason that we use people's peaceful civil disobedience isn't because it, it sounds good or you know, it's morally just. Those things are, are benefits and, and bonuses. But as I say, when you have only one shot at turning the ship around, at survival of the entire human race and, and nature itself, we must choose the most effective strategy possible to us, not just because uh, some form of strategy is emulated or, or considered more morally correct in society, or as I just say, that is a bonus. Uh, next slide, please. So what Extinction Rebellion did when sitting down to think of its strategy is we went to the social science. I mean, we go to the science for, for climate change to tell us what's happening. So let's go to the social science and tell us what's the most effective type of resistance for mass system change. And uh, Chenoweth and Stephen did an extremely important paper at the end of the 2000s. In fact, Erica Chenoweth originally set out to uh, confirm the assumptions he had that violent resistance and violent rebellion were the most effective types of overthrowing governments and creating the change you want. But when she went to actually empirically measure uh, civil disobedience and revolutions from the year uh, 1900 to 2006, she actually found the exact opposite. Nonviolent campaigns were more likely to win uh, legitimacy, affect long-lasting uh, change, win domestic and international support, uh, and compel the kind of loyalty shifts and system change uh, that you need. Next slide, please. Uh, in fact, uh, she found that nonviolent campaigns were twice as likely to secede uh, as, as violent campaigns, which is really, uh, you know, kind of great research for those of us um, who think this is the morally correct way to go. Uh, next slide, please. And she also found out that, in fact, this trend is increasing. There are more successful uh, nonviolent, peaceful, civil disobedience acti actions working and having an effect than nonviolent. And this is a trend that is uh, continuing. Next slide, please. So for us kind of in, in the Western world, this, as Erica was thinking, that this is kind of contrary to one's beliefs. I mean, we see on TV all the time, uh, anyone who's watching the Avengers or Game of Thrones, it's violence, violence, violence for people to affect their, affect their needs. When we look at our own history books or consider the kind of um, cultural revolutionary icons that we consider even here in Ireland, it's full of violence. So we actually, we really have to kind of, from our perspective, look at, for example, in other parts of the world. And there's other parts of the world that are doing this far better than we are. Um, the um, actions in Yugoslavia in 2000 to overthrow Slavodan Milosevic. Next slide, please. What's happening in Sudan right now? Peaceful uh, civil disobedience taking place to overthrow their president, uh, led by many women. And next slide, please and uh, the protests against Algeria's president that has led to his ousting. Now, peaceful civil disobedience doesn't work 100% of the time, but it gives you the maximum chance of success. Now, there's four key points you have to follow in the uh, civil disobedience kind of rule book to maximize your chance. One, you've got to go to the capital city. You've got to get in the faces of the elites and the government, and you've got to get them to notice. It has to be non-violent, because you need to bring in as many, many people uh, to point three, from across the community as possible. And also, anyone can take part in nonviolent civil disobedience. Anyone that's trying to feed a baby that doesn't want to be fed understands that anyone can take part in nonviolent civil disobedience. <laughs> so it really grabs as many people and brings them to your movement as possible. Also, with nonviolent civil disobedience, it's found that where it's rural, uh, city, uh, types of affluence, types of backgrounds, you're far more likely to get people to want to engage in it from across the community than you are with violent uh, disobedience. So that's important as well for the kind of uh, future that you want for your community. And four, very importantly, it needs to be more than one day. You need to take to the streets continuously, 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 and get in the face uh, of the government and not let them move. Get them in their face, and you need to block business as usual, whether that be the military not letting them move around cities, whether it be the economic 
um, functioning of the city-state. I say London's a good example of that. That was about the tactics there were to hit uh, the government and companies in their pockets and with the economy. Next slide, please. There's also a very important 3.5 rule of success. The research found that when you mobilize continuously, day after day, peacefully, 3.5% of a population, without fail, that revolution was successful. So 3.5% of a population isn't, isn't nothing. But in Ireland, we're already at about 11,000 with our school strikers. So that's a really good start. 3.5% is about 130,000. But once you get to the 3.5%, we find that things really steamroll and the, rev and the revolution and the rebellion never fails. And so that's really, really an important number, 3.5%, and gives us hope. Uh, next slide, please. So the international rebellion, I just want to talk about the tactics that were used in London uh, a little bit, considering what we just saw. So thank you very much. So what we did in London was, as I say, we blockaded five sites. And that was to just disrupt the economic workings of a capital city right in the face of the elites. We did it day after day, and we did a strategic escalation day after day. First day was about blocking streets. The second day we blocked other roads. The third day we, we blocked the transport systems to bring it to a halt. Uh, the fourth day we were up, up, in, up in trees and blocking, even went to a Heathrow protest. So every day it keeps escalating bigger and bigger and bigger. And with peaceful civil disobedience, you really put the authorities in a bind, a really important bind, because if they arrest you, then you get more uh, sympathy and you get more uh, attention for your cause. And if they don't arrest you, well, then you continue to hold the street and your rebellion continues. So I think that's nicely shown by a short video that the Sunday Times actually took of Extinction Rebellion that shows the kind of bind we put the authorities in. I'm supporting these protests because I think we're not just heading towards the cliff, we're falling down. And if we don't stop the immoderate exploitation of non-renewable resources, we are going to die. Extinction Rebellion. It's the protest that has gridlocked a city. For the last week, thousands of climate change protesters have blocked four of London's key roadways and junctions. But it's not just the streets that have been paralysed. Police and politicians have also been left impotent, apparently lacking any means of dealing with protesters who reject all violence and whose cause, greenhouse gas reductions, is actually official government policy. For some police officers, the dilemma and the boredom of standing guard over such well-behaved demonstrators has been too much. But the reality is that, in the absence of any violence, their powers are limited. They can try to use the laws on public order or obstructing the highway, but the protesters' human rights to freedom of expression and freedom of assembly mean the police have to be careful about arrests. There are practical problems too. Many demonstrators have glued or locked themselves to obstacles, so trying to use force risks injuring them. And the Met Police is all too aware of how it might look to drag away thousands of peaceful protesters by force. The presence of celebrities like actress Emma Thompson, a keen supporter of Extinction Rebellion, adds to those tensions. I've been with Greenpeace to the Arctic twice. I've stood on the, on the bare glaciers. I've seen the plastic in the oceans. I've seen evidence for myself. And I really do care about my children and my grandchildren enough to want to be here today to stand next to the next generation. Politicians have criticised the police, but for them the dilemma is even greater. Hardly a word has been heard from Greg Clark, the Energy Secretary, who is supposedly responsible for reducing Britain's greenhouse gas emissions. Sajid Javid, whose Conservative Party leadership hopes may even depend on his handling of this crisis, has demanded the police use the full force of the law, while knowing that law is pretty weak. Tying the police and politicians up in such knots is, however, just what Extinction Rebellion's organisers had in mind. What, though, would success look like? Humanity is pouring the equivalent of 50 billion tonnes of CO2 into the air each year, nearly double the amount in 1975, and still rising. It means Britain and the world face temperature rises of 3 to 4 degrees centigrade by 2080, and further increases to follow. Britain's own emissions and imports account for about 1 billion tonnes of that global total, and successive governments have pledged to cut that back. So far, however, they're failing miserably. Extinction Rebellion argues that this will only change when people take to the streets and force governments into reform. 
Gridlock now, they say, is a small price to pay for saving the planet. Thanks. Uh, next slide. So based on the, those kind of tactics and our first demand of our protest was for governments to declare a climate emergency coming off the back of that Scotland and Wales have declared climate emergencies and today in the Parliament of Westminster uh, Labour have a motion to declare a climate emergency in the UK. So to finish up what I'd say is that we have one shot at this. The social science tells us that peaceful civil dis disobedience is the most effective method that we can use. We've got to go to the capital cities, we've got to disrupt business as usual, we've got to do it day after day after day, and we have to be strategic and we have to stand together. And we have to all come together across communities and do it together. Thanks.